Today, we're sitting down with one of the newest members of the Initialized Investing Team. Scott Moss joined Initialized as a principal last year from our open search process. In fact, he found out about us by watching this YouTube channel, just like what you're doing now. Before joining us, he was an engineer at Netflix where he worked on the smart TV app. So that means if you ever press the Netflix button on your remote and tuned in to watch your favorite TV show or movie, you've probably used something Scott built. Before Netflix, he was CEO of Type, a YC company working on basically an early version of a headless CMS. Here at Initialized, Scott does a lot to help founders with engineering recruitment and talent questions. Scott's got a YouTube channel of his own, so today we're doing a collab. After you watch this one all the way to the end, you can head over to Scott's channel linked below. Let's get started. Scott, thanks for coming on the channel, man. Thanks for having me, Gary. It's been a long time coming. And honestly, like, thank you for coming to work with us at Initialize. It's been awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, why would I not, right? Like, who would pass up an opportunity like this? This has kind of always been, like, the eventual end goal, even though I didn't know it. So, like, I'm just super thankful to be here, man. How, how did you come into tech yourself? And then maybe we start even earlier, which is, like, walk me through, you know, where you came from and... Yeah, you know that story. I, th I think a lot of it had to do with like just growing up with like a, a big family with nothing really. Like we grew up with nothing, and that kind of led me to this point where, you know, everything was magical for me. Like a video game console was like magic to me because I never had one, and you know, a computer was magical. So like that's I think where my obsession with technology started is because first computer. What was it? First computer. It was a Sony Vio. Right on, right on. Yeah, it was yeah, a yeah. power. I remember that uh, because I spilled water on it. <laughs> and I tried to take it apart, and that's when I learned what a CPU was and RAM and, and all that other did stuff. Did you fix it? No, I did oh, not no. fix it. No, there was no fixing that uh, because I plugged it in soon after I spilled water on it, and I didn't know that you shouldn't have done that. Uh, but, yeah, it, I think it started with that, and then eventually, like, um, you know, transitioning into the military, which is eventually what I, w what I went into, I was able, you know, finally afford, be able to afford some small things here and there. And like, I realized I was like, wow, like, this is cool. Like, I want to make this stuff because like, you know, I worked on helicopters when I was in the Navy. And like, after you build that confidence of like, not knowing how to work on a helicopter to taking it apart and put it back together in four weeks, you're like, oh wait, I, I think I can do anything, right? So I was like, well, what if I could make technology, right? So I think that was kind of the start of it. And then it just happened to be a coincidence that like, you know, the path of becoming an engineer or becoming in, like getting into tech, you know, most of those careers are like, you know, they have like, uh, you know, employees that are typically happy. Like, so I was like looking for a, a career that I was going to be happy and, and, and not be depressed and all this stuff. And it just so happens I love technology. The career path is, you know, uh, uh, spits out happy employees. So I was just like, let me try that. And, you know, one Google query later, top happiest careers in the world software engineer was on there. So I was like, let's do that. And that's kind of where it started. I guess going back, I mean, that's something that a lot of people don't appreciate. I mean, the kind of life that you know, we can give our kids now is like not the kind of life that we came up through actually. Absolutely not. Like it, this is, it's funny because like, I, I didn't fathom like where I would be. And like, I, I just didn't accept that, you know, the reality that I live right now is, is where, you know, where I was trying to be. It was just more like, I just want to do something cool, right? And I just want to be part of something big. And I, I didn't I didn't know that the opportunity was as big as it is. Like that just came later, right? And and I wish, uh, maybe if I would have known that sooner, I probably would have taken advantage of it a lot sooner. Maybe I would have learned to code when I was 17 and not 23. Uh, but yeah, it, it worked out. <laughs> I guess one thing that's really unusual about being a venture capitalist is that like, you know, we sort our day to day is so full of like abundance. And then what I realized is, you know, for, for me growing up, like the child of, you know, Chinese immigrants, mm. um, they came to this country with basically nothing. Right. And then uh, we actually grew up in, you know, one and two bedroom apartments. Like my, my dad was an alcoholic wow. and uh, we actually often were food insecure. Like sometimes yep. I'd come home and, you know, let myself in. My mom was sleeping because she worked all night as wow. a certified nurse assistant. Like she always wanted to become a registered nurse, but she didn't have the language skills mm -hmm. and she had learning disabilities. So she couldn't like get to the yeah. next level. And so 
you know, sometimes I had to, you know, tear up some whatever bread was like, you know, in the cupboard and put some milk on it. And that was my that dinner. Was my mom used to call it air sauce and wind pudding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what she would say. That, that's what y'all going to eat tonight. And that's what we ate. Yeah. Like, and it was, we used our imagination and like it was, so yeah, that was, that was rough. Like, you know, I, I guess I just never thought that anything beyond that was possible because I didn't see any examples either. Right. Like everyone I knew was either playing basketball or football or selling drugs. And like, that was success where I was from. So like having the thought of like, yeah, I'm going to be Bill Gates one day or something like that. Like, you're right. Like you would get, you would get shunned at school. Like that's not going to happen. So, you know, and where it, was this actually in, in Atlanta, Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia, you know, that that's, and I love Atlanta people who are out there from Atlanta, uh, still home. Uh, but like, yeah, it was, it was a different time back then, you know, in the early nineties, you know, 2000s, it's a completely different time. Like I remember like going to school and having like, you know, all my friends were like prepping for SATs and stuff. And like my counselor wouldn't even prep me on it. They were just like, don't worry, you'll, you'll graduate. Like, I didn't even know what an SAT was. I didn't even know what college prep meant. You know, it was just like, you know, get out of here. So, and they didn't like, even want to tell you then. You know, they, yeah, exactly. They didn't really want to tell me or educate me on that. And it's like, they had no hope for me. Like, why would I have hope for myself? You know, which is eventually why I dropped out. You know, I dropped out for almost two years because no one believed in me. I was just like, if no one believes in me, then I guess I'm not worth anything. So why, why would I continue to do this? You know? But then there was something that you saw and sort of, you know, even getting that Sony Vio yeah. and like, get, you know, getting on the internet for the first time. And then, I don't know, it's, there's something about that that opened up this other world then. Yeah, it, you know, I've been thinking about this a long time and, and like reflecting back, I think a lot of it had to do with my older sister. Like she was two years older than me. But she was like a phenom in basketball, like super well-known McDonald's all-star basketball, which is basically like the all-star of high school. And, you know, she was raised in the same household as I was, but she found success. And like just seeing that example, like just made me think that, like, I guess I can do something. I don't know what it is, but I feel like I can do something And like something just clicked in my head to where I felt like before I feel like the world was against me. And then immediately I realized I was just in my own way and it was just me. And there was always going to be a reason and someone that wasn't going to support me, but yet I could still make progress. And like, once that clicked, I went back to school, you know, I graduated a year late instead of two years late. And like, you know, I got good grades and like, I've just been driven ever since that moment of just been like, I can just do whatever I want if I just go out there and, and make it happen and, and stop blaming other people, you know, just, just get it done. So I think that's what it was, just really seeing that example, like just that's powerful for me, yeah. And then I guess flash forward a little bit, you were mentioning, you know, coming out of uh, the armed forces and thank you for your service. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just going on the internet again, seeing, oh, this is a career that is something that is accessible. It's like something that, yeah. you know, learning to code was this thing that you could just do, but then fit in immediately. Like there's sort of a big tent here. I think it started like with like obsessing over like, I used to just like go to like Barnes and Nobles. It's so funny saying Barnes and Nobles now. Like I used to go to there and like get magazines, like Forbes magazines or Inc magazines and like watch these business tycoons. And I'm like, wow, I wanna be that. Yeah. That's what I wanna do. And like they all came from like tech. And I was like, what is this world? Again, like learning how to do all that stuff in the military. What I, looking back, what I realized is they actually taught me how to learn. Right. They literally teach you how to learn anything in a matter of weeks, like the most complicated stuff out there is like, yeah, you'll do that in a week and you're going to go out there and you're going to produce. So like that was that was easy for me. So like me having this idea of like, oh, I can just learn like this one percent skill in the world of like learning the code and go do it. I was like, yeah, like, why, why not? Like, you know, that seemed in incredibly possible to me. Uh, and it seemed like the closest thing I'll get to to having like superpowers, right? Like being a superhero or like Harry Potter or something. So I was like, yeah, I totally I totally want to do that. And. You know, there was really no path in the military to do that. So I knew I had to leave to, to make it happen. And, you know, it was always like a goal of mine to like move to the Bay and, and, and just be involved in that, I don't know, that industry of just like what's creating the future. Because as a, as a kid, I mentally had to escape to the future because I didn't like my current situation. So I lived in my mind in the future of this world that I created for myself. So like to be able to create that as a technologist, like I wanted every part of it. So it made sense. That's funny that you mentioned uh, Barnes & Noble. I mean, Barnes & Noble was a big thing for me because, you know, 15, 16, you know, I wanted to learn to code or mm. like, you know, work with databases and things like that. And then I'd go to Barnes & Noble to the computer, the programming section, 
And you know, it's not like I had 30 bucks to like just buy the book right. and bring it home. I would just go there. To read it there. I just read it yeah, there. Yeah. And the cool thing is no one hassled me, thankfully. Nobody you know? said anything, yeah. Yeah, those are the good days. I remember that. I used to just go there and just read like, you know, Wired Magazine or like there was this, I think the first book I read, and it's still a very popular book now. It's like an HTML and CSS book. I forgot who the author is, but it's like super well known. And like, that's when it like clicked for me. I was like, wait, I can make stuff and this is what it is. Like, and I just like went home and like did that. And I remember just like spending every dollar that I had on a MacBook and like took my little 15 days of vacation and just like killed that book, just completely crushed it. And like, that's when I knew like, this is it. I have to do this. Once you learned to code, you actually not only learned to code, you actually became uh, sort of an expert at teaching people how to code. Yeah, yeah, it's surprisingly like, I guess this might have came from the military as well, is that like every time you quali you know, get qualified up is what we call the military, you learn a new qualification, you are now responsible for teaching the next people, right? And, and I always hated that. I thought that was kind of silly, but like looking back and realize that's how they solidify that information is like, oh, now you know that thing, turn around and go teach these people. So I just kept doing that and you know, I guess what I realized was for, you know, if, if I just learned this thing today, there are a hundred people that are still trying to learn it. So it still may be beginner material, it still may, you know, seem, you know, nonsense to the more advanced people, but there's way more beginners than there are advanced people. So I was like, someone out there needs to hear what I just learned. So, and I need to teach it so I can actually solidify it. So I always just surrounded myself around people that were also learning and I just shared them like, hey, this is what I learned today. Did you know you could do that? And that just became part of my learning like thesis. Like I just had to do that. Otherwise I couldn't have said that I've learned anything. And it just, it just kind of went hand in hand and uh, yeah, it worked out somehow. <laughs> but yeah, I, I do say that teaching is, is a, a really big hobby of mine. So that sort of led to basically running some of the coding uh, camps and things like that yeah. for even Fortune 500 companies. Actually. Oh yeah, yeah, that's crazy. So. Uh, it, I gave a talk at a conference, which was a moonshot, by the way. Like I reached out to some conference organizer on Twitter. I was like, you think I can speak at this conference? I just graduated a coding boot camp, And they were like, sure, I guess, right? And I was like, so thankful for that. And after that conference, I had a bunch of people from like, you know, these Fortune 500 companies like come up and like, hey, do you think you could teach that to our engineers? I'm like, I literally just learned to code three months ago. You know, in my head, that's what I'm thinking, but you know, I'm not saying that. So I'm kind of <laughs> panicking. And yeah, I just, you know, I was like, I'll just ignore them. They'll go away. You know, they didn't go away. They kept emailing me. I was like, no, we really want you to come do this. And I'm like, wow, like they think I'm the expert. And then I started believing, I guess I am the expert, right? Like I didn't lie about any of that stuff on stage. I actually do know this stuff. So yeah, that's when it transitioned into like, you know, working with those companies and teaching them and, and doing, you know, uh, everything from, you know, teaching them on a new technology to helping them build out different stuff. And I got to see that world of just like how they operate at a high level and like, all the inefficiencies there and then and the culture of like corporate companies and like all this stuff. And I really felt for the first time that like, like I belonged and not only did I belong, like I was, I was getting up there, right? Like I was seeing it at a higher level than most people and I was just getting started. So like that is enough to like keep you going. It's kind of like a, a dopamine drip of progress that just feeds into more progress and it just keeps going. So like, yeah, that was, that was life changing as well to go through that. So fast forward a little bit, you know, you heard about this thing called Y Combinator uh, yeah. and then, but you were also, you know, teaching people how to make websites and, you know, uh, that sort of came together in a way, right? Because the startup yeah. was actually based on also making it really easy for people to make websites. Yeah, it was. So like after, after working with those companies for so long, which like we went from, you know, charging people like $10,000 to charging them $2 million. And ironically enough, we got tired of that. Like it was not fulfilling, like having to travel and work with these bigger companies and do things like that. But what we learned was that they all had this problem of like, how do I manage content in the website you just helped us build for a year? And I'm like, oh, y'all didn't think of that? Like, I thought you figured that out. And they were like, no, we, we didn't. And I'm like, oh, this last company we worked with said the same thing, interesting. So we decided, you know, we're burnt out on this. These people need this, let's just build this thing, right? So we started working on that CMS and they were like, oh yeah, we need funding because we didn't save any of the money we just made from the last two years because we were so irresponsible. With the, like we spent every dollar that we had, like, you know, all the millions we made, gone. Like you just forget about it. Like here I am, you know, basically about to foreclose on my home and I'm like, hey, I'm about to start a company. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, within two months, we, we put something out there. We got a lot of people to sign up for it, uh, for, for the waiting list at least. And then I remember reaching out to, um, 
who was it? I think I reached out to Justin Khan, actually. I was following him on Snapchat for a while and I just always reached out to him randomly. And I was like, yo, Justin, like, what do you think? You think I should apply to YC? And he was like, I don't know, man. Like, hit up Michael and see what he says. And I remember I hit up Michael and I sent him this long email. It was like, like a super long email. I don't even know what was in it. I just remember him responding and being like, he responded with a link. And the link was to a blog post that he wrote that says, this is how you email me. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And I was like, okay, let me reformat this email. And I sent it to him and he said the same thing, just apply. So we applied, which by the way, was my third time applying to YC. Somehow we got in. And it was like, again, life changing. My, my brother was my co-founder and, and my best friend was also my other co-founder. And yeah, we just couldn't believe that we, we made it in. It was ridiculous. And you raised money you know, yeah, off, to we, the, you know, off to the races, really. Yeah, we raised money. We, we actually made an impact there with the people in our group. Like, mm -hmm. believe it or not, like we realized that like we actually did fit in and, and we had really good advice to give and different things like that. So I think we raised about $2 million for that startup. Uh, we ran it for three years. And ultimately, like most startups, it, it just didn't work out the way that we wanted it to. We had a lot of founder drama, right? We had a lot of things going, COVID happened. There was just a lot of stuff going on. And I think ultimately, like, we just got burned out from, you know, the fact that one, we didn't know what we were doing. Two, like, you know, everyone was just kind of fed up with, the, with everything that was going on in the environment. And three, yeah, we kind of like missed all the deadlines that we made, especially in that space as a dev tools company, like everything kind of relies on like partnerships. And like, you know, if there's one hot product, you got to tie yourself to that product. And if you miss it, you, it's gone. And like, I think we were trying to tie ourselves to some other product at the time and, and we partnered with them, but we missed all the deadlines. So we were like, okay, what are we going to do? So like, yeah, that, that, it didn't really work out, but man, I learned a lot. I learned so much about what it means to be like a, you know, a founder and, and interacting with investors and doing a whole circuit of raising money and managing people, which is something that I don't like doing and, and things like that. But yeah, it was very interesting. I mean, the quest for product market fit is fraught. And <laughs> yeah. you know, I have That's to say true. like, you know, for posturous for my startup, like, mm we hit product market fit and then we lost it. So wow. it's like, you know, there are lots of, the road for startups is very long. And it is, <laughs> and it, you always think you know what it is, right? Like you feel so confident when you raise the money and you have a great idea of what you're gonna do. And then when you actually get out there, you realize you have no clue. Like, because the market is so different, it's so dynamic and you know, the market always wins and it doesn't really matter what you have planned. If you can't adjust and, and realign and, and like, you know, like we were trying to innovate on the product, which, we're all engineers, so that's of course what we tried to do. But we should have been innovating on like the go to market and like how do we capitalize on that? And like we just thought that that would come to us. Like if we build it, they'll come. And no, they, they never came. So, but we ended up building the app like five times over and over and over again. So if, if anybody wants to build a CMS, like let me know. I'll, I'll tell you how to build a CMS. So yeah, that was, that was basically my experience with that. Well, that catches us up a little bit to today. I mean, obviously we get to work with you today, but also just you know, one of the things you've been working on with your YouTube channel yeah. and your content is really helping people, you know, both help help founders hire the right people. Yeah. And then on the flip side, like helping people who might be, you know, from your story, my story, yeah. who like, you know, want to get in. It's like, how do you get in? Right? Yeah. Like, you know, getting into tech or even VC is like, it's kind of like this mysterious, like walled garden. It's like either you're in or you know someone that's in and everyone else on the outside, it's, it's like, well, how did you do that? How did you anger yourself? So like, you know, I didn't have a lot of people to help me do that. So I'm very passionate about reaching back and allowing people that access, giving them that advice. Um, so like, that's something I'm very passionate about. Like you said, I speak a lot on, on my channel. Uh, and then like, when it comes to like helping, you know, the founders that we work with find those, those you know, technical talent uh, people like, yeah, I think we were really blessed with our company because again, we were all engineers. We were all very, into like these technical communities with like the conferences we spoke at and hackathons that we did that we actually knew how to do that very well. And, and that's something that I was able to help a lot of companies with at YC is like, this is how you hire, this is how you do that. So that's something I've always like, hey, at least I was able to do that. So like coming here to initialize and doing that just seemed like a no brainer, um, especially at a time like this where the market is just insane and, and everybody we invest in is probably gonna have this problem. So like it, it just made sense to you know, really align myself with that. And, and I really think there's a lot of room for innovation in that space because traditionally the way that we hire is it, it, just not gonna be effective today and it, it needs to change. So, you know, I wanna help bring about that change and, you know, being here to initialize is positioning me well to, uh, to do that. Seems like one of the things that, you know, both of us sort of talk about, you know, off camera, but I don't know if we've ever talked about it on camera is like, there's this idea of like the perfect 
founder mm. or the perfect engineer. And then it's sort of like checkbox, 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 turn off your brain, like hire them. Yeah. And it's like, that's sort of, I mean, you alluded to this just now. It's like, this, this is like sort of the way it's been done, yep. but that's not how it should be done. And we exactly. would live in a better, more just, like frankly, like a place where more people had jobs and were doing good yep. work if it wasn't like a checkbox, checkbox, checkbox sort of thing, whether it's right. funding startups or hiring engineers. Right, yeah, like it's it's not so black and white anymore. Like we, the market has shifted to, you know, be less favorable for the people hiring the talent. So like you don't have the luxury of just creating your rubric of who is going to pass and who is not. Like you, you don't have the luxury of hiring that jerk that's super talented and that's gonna lead you to a billion dollar valuation. Because, you know, on the other side, we have, you know, really cool companies like Career Karma, that's helping people transition into these you know, new roles, but like they don't have a lot of experience, but they're super talented and they have tons of potential. And that's what the market is putting out right now. But yet as you know, founders, we're not looking at that. We all think we're the next Google today and we wanna hire the next Sergi Brin or whatever. Like it's, it's not gonna work. Like you can't defeat the market. So you really have to just switch over what it is that you consider good. And what I'm finding out that it's really looking into you know, does this person really agree with our mission? You know, do they fit culturally? Because everybody's remote now. Like you have to be able to trust that this person is going to be effective when they're on the other side of the world and you can't see them every day, right? Which is always going to be a problem. And then the other thing is just like potential, right? Like if you think about it, it's actually more economical to hire someone with tons of potential that is a culture fit because they'll grow into the role that you're trying to hire today. Or you can spend all the money and resources trying to find that person and maybe hire them in six months when you could have hired early and they would have been there in six months. Uh, so like that's the way that I'm looking at it. That's where I think a lot of the success is. Um, but it's just very weird how we get there. You know, changing the way that we interview, changing our job descriptions, you know, changing our expectations. It's, it's, there's just a lot going on there uh, that I think really needs to be looked at. And that's some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about on my channel. Click over in the link in the description, check out Scott's channel, and make sure you click subscribe and the bell icon because <laughs> yeah. that's what's up. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. This is super amazing. This is something that you know I wanted to do for a while, so I'm glad we got it done. Great to work with you, man. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, thanks for coming on.